This is Marlene, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. Whether you're watching a video or listening to a podcast, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. Links to videos or MP3 files can be found on MiamiGhostChronicles.com. Go to MarlenePardo.com for information on new book releases. I narrate several podcast series that can be found on major podcast platforms and can also be listened to via Alexa, Sonos, and other home systems. Look for Supernatural Storytime for scary storytelling, Nightshade Diary for classic horror and adventure stories, Stories of the Supernatural for interviews with different guests on the show. If you want to get noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime, conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird, you can visit Strange Than Fiction Stories tab at MiamiGhostChronicles.com or find us on Blogspot. I want to thank you for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi, everybody. This is Marlene with Stories of the Supernatural. How's everybody doing? Good? I'm good. Kind of. Kind of. For all my... Uh, People that follow me on the, the my chicken kingdom stories, let me tell you something. It was a bad week in chicken kingdom for Marlene. I had a, uh, as for the people that don't know, I, I've, I moved out here to a very um, country, let's put it this way, the town I moved into is a population of 5,000, very rural area in North Florida, which of course what comes with it is a lot of wild things. Bottom line, I, I had lost chickens to owls. I had some hawks around, but they were smaller. Most of my chickens were okay, unless they were like this, the chicks. Well, the other day, I, I'm thinking it's either, I might be a golden eagle, a lot bigger bird of prey. Killed three of my chickens so far. Three. And I even got one. I had one who was kind of like wonky, one of my uh, silkies, and I had him in a pen. You know, it, what it is, it was a, a, one of those dog crates. You know how you, uh, and, and every once in a while, I would put him out there so he could get some sun and that thing got him through the bars. Okay. Little was left of that chicken. So yeah, for any of you following me on my chicken, uh, chicken journey, it was a bad week for Marlene. So now I call this bird because I caught it once. The first time I, I found what was left of the chickens. The other time I caught it, it's like, once they find out about, they come back. And I realized this thing is huge. So I call it the mega nemesis. <laughs> Not going to do anything to it because it's, it's following its nature, but it's like, it's you and me. Okay. Like I, <laughs> so yeah, that's my mega nemesis now. So if anybody knows that's yeah, the, 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 the regular hawks and the owls, they just went down into like the, you know, the owl, I know all I have to do is just worry about after, after dark, but three chickens in a week. Oh, no, Martin's not happy. Anyway, let's get on to other things. Um, my sponsor plan to stay um, They carry uh, a lot of camping sporting equipment. They've got a lot of neat spy gear, like uh, cameras in your eyeglasses. They have stuff in like, um, like a, you have a, a wireless uh, phone charger. They've got a hidden camera in there. They got stuff like that, real neat stuff that uh, you could use. They also have a lot of the travel alarms. Let's say you're going traveling and you want to put something on your doorknob. Uh, just in case somebody opens the door, they've got a lot of stuff like that. That's portable and it's really useful. Um, you know, for a lot of people, yeah, you might have a home security system at home, but there's things that sometimes you want to carry with you when you're traveling and they've got things of that nature. They've got a lot of stuff. So go ahead and check them out. Um, plan to stay safe.com. All right. Let's get on to the good part. The good part is the guest that I have on here today, which is the first time that he's here on Stories of the Supernatural. And uh, I know a lot of you are going to be really interested in this subject. And the death of a loved one can have such a profound effect on one's perception of life on earth as we know it. Death can make you question the reason for your existence. Why are you here? What is your purpose? And why on earth do we live only to die? Now, the gentleman that I'm going to bring on, his name is Michael Habernig. And he is the founder of Path 11. OK. And what happened with Michael is he experienced a large number of deaths in a very short period of time of friends and family members and pets 
Oh, as a matter of fact, in a year and a half. So he went into a period of depression that triggered him to explore the concept of life after death, which this happens to a lot of people. And in 2007, he decided to use his expertise in filmmaking to search out experts that could provide answers for his first documentary, Exploring Life After Death. And he's reached out to local hypnotherapists, people who could astral project, quantum physics experts, and healers. And after a year of gathering experts and catching up on his solo film project, it was at this point, he came across another partner, which is April Hanna. But what I have with us today is Michael. Help me welcome him. How are you doing today, well, uh, Michael? Oh, doing pretty good. How about you? Good, good, good. Yeah. Let me ask you, I know that in the bio, it mentions that you had amount, a year and a half is really a very short time, uh, deaths that affected you. What, prior to this, had you ever had any interest like this in life, afterlife subject or anything like that? Yeah, and and, and looking back, there's been times throughout even my like early childhood to like teenage years, I've always had uh, an interest in this. Um, I, I remember, um, like I, I used to watch the X Files, uh, you know, okay. um, and they were more alien based, and you know that. Um, and then at one point, I got a copy of the book by Daniel Brinkley. Um, yes, I can't remember the name of it. I read this the first. The... I, know, I know he did like a number of books, but it was the first two that he did. That, mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember them. Something in the light, and. Uh, yeah, so I was very interested in that, and um, you know, I came from a very religious background, so it's like we talked about it, but it was never in depth, and we didn't go past that religious border. So anything that didn't include anything that was related to the Bible, we never talked about because that was the you know dangerous and, territory. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it was shortly. Um, yeah, this is probably about now 2007. That's almost 10 years after, you know, living on my own. Um, I got married shortly after I moved out of my parents' house. So, um, yeah, it, uh, I, was, I was able to kind of freely research this topic now. And, I, I, you know, YouTube was in its early stages. So there was like 15-minute clips here and there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Greg Braden, who's not really an after-death kind of guy afterlife type of guy but he, he does talk very spiritual stuff um yeah. found thomas campbell who we later interviewed for the documentaries um uh, william buhlman's another another one that uh, was he's very big into astral projection uh so okay. talking to that to them as well as uh, people that april had known because she's been studying it this stuff years longer than i have okay. and we found experts that you know, that taught her um, that we were able to talk to, interview, and it, it just opened up this whole new world. Um, about Let me ask you something. What, what happened to you were, what, what happened was that, because you said, oh, I grew up in a religious household, okay, which obviously, even if they didn't want to talk about it, I'm sure they, certain things are supposed to happen to you after you die, as in, did you feel at that point, is that really what happens? Is that what you were questioning? Or is there something else beyond what I was taught as I was growing up? I, yeah, um, it's a good question. It's kind of like if you live a certain way, mm -hmm. when you die, it's going to be a good or bad. There's, it's punishment or reward. Right. Um, and I, I shouldn't say it was my immediate household. Like my parents are actually probably the most liberal um, spiritual liberal, um, mm -hmm. and they, I, I, I later found out that my dad used to uh, research, I guess, lucid dreaming back when he was in college. Really? Uh, <laughs> and, Isn't it uh, funny sometimes when you find out about your parents, like what they were up to before they yeah, became parents? <laughs> and my mom actually, probably about five years before I even started the films or even researching any of this, she was kind of looking into past life regression stuff and she had saw uh, a few mediums uh, that came, you know, into town. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's 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 like I couldn't have picked better a better pathway if I was planning this life. I probably couldn't have picked a better okay way to because it, it's uh, and and looking back, it's like from childhood to going to college for film school and then later working in TV, live TV, then advertising. 
um, it was like this path just fell in front of me and it's just like it, it it I couldn't have planned it any better and then having okay. the parents who you know that actually support me doing this right I know their parents <laughs> were not were, were right, actually right. the strict ones yeah yeah and that's what I'm saying but and like you said a lot of judeo-christian beliefs are if you're good you go to heaven yeah you know, if you're bad yeah. you're gonna burn in the hot place <laughs> you know it's yeah. like that's it and of course you know <laughs> contrary to even though it's more liberal you know uh, there's no the the how can I say re reincarnation like that you get another chance at it no this is like your one chance to do good or that's it you're in trouble for eternity <laughs> yeah and yeah. um and it always uh a lot of that though always sometimes fails to explain sometimes what happens when people see apparitions or or what they call death crisis uh you know like somebody that's just passed away that a family member will see them. It kind of leaves like a, this, like you said, sometimes people don't want to talk about that because it's like, no, 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 let's not talk about that. Um, yeah. So w w in the, how long did it take you to do the, that documentary that you started? We started that in the spring of 2008. Mm -hmm. um, I had done research on my own in 2007. That's when uh, a lot of family members were passing away. Some, okay. ex, you know, some were expected. They were elderly. Uh, right. And then there were a handful of unexpected, some tragic okay. uh, deaths. Uh, yeah. And then it was just that spring. I, I was like, I, you know, whether it's at the time I'm thinking, you know, maybe this, we do a couple series on YouTube, just like interviews here and there. <clears throat> right. And then I, I thought, why not just go all in and make a, movie out of it and then of course working with april you know we we got all this footage and we've we outlined it that we could actually i think we started with four four films okay. and the one there was one film we, we called it film number three okay which was more about healing and reiki it kind of didn't fit in with the overall with scope the so it ended up being a trilogy let me ask you when you started doing the documentary as far as the interviewing yeah. Did you find out things that were like, wow, I didn't know this or, you know, because you said I did research before. Yeah. The, what, what happened with that? Well, it's, it's kind of funny. We, we going into like, especially the first film. Um, and it's probably the film that we liked the least <laughs> because we, it was a learning experience. So mm -hmm. our questions that we were asking were kind of all over the place. And now if I were to do a, another film, it would be to the point um strict outline i know exactly what i'm asking i kind of i kind of know what kind of answer i'm going to get based on how much research i've done but that first film we didn't we did enough research to know who to talk to we didn't know exactly what to, to ask them but um when we got into the conversation it's usually after that first hour we start getting surprises um okay. from some of our responses um like tom campbell um i was in the middle of reading his books he's got three you know books i, I can't remember how many pages but they're a good size and they're mm -hmm. heavy reading um it's very scientific um okay. I, it's like very uh not math but math concepts and science right. concepts which that's not really me <laughs> i'm more mm -hmm. of the, the 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 art and visual so you know that he, he, I think he's right brain. I'm left brain. I think that's the, the, the term, but he, he provided some, he really, I guess for me, he, he kind of dumbed it down a little bit for the okay. interview. And we, we've got something like, I don't know. It's like 12 hours of footage of just his interview. And it was over, okay. we filmed it over two days and some of the stuff that he was he gave us stuff that was not in the books and actually okay. some of it he later told us not to publish okay because we were just having candid conversations and but at one point we were in this little cabin filming him and we were in there for so long the one day i think it was the first day he began to read our minds oh. um and i don't know if you're familiar that, that, with okay. Okay, you cut out a little bit. I'm sorry. What was it that you said that you had uh, that you were in there so many yeah. days? Uh, we were in there like two and a half days. I want to say it was okay, maybe two full days. And 
each day, you know, we're doing like six, eight hours a day with him. And wow. so after a while, he began to read our minds. So okay. it, it's like I, we have a question that we're going to ask him next. And he goes from one answer and he just starts. He goes, oh, I just want to answer that question that you're you're going to ask. Wow. And then he. he OK, he you're like, so. all righty, then this is what so, happens after. Yeah. Let me ask you in conclusion, though. Is he does he believe in the afterlife or the survival of the yes. spirit, the soul after human death of the body? Yeah, uh, he he does. He um, but it's it's a little more with him, especially. He he's a little more scientific. So he right, and I know what you're saying as far as uh, he, he, we do have this consciousness that does. We shed the body and we go we move on he talks about um he, he compares it to a video game that's probably the best way to put it okay so it's more like this avatar that we're you know playing around mm -hmm. um just dies and you get another avatar and you come back and you do it again and right you, you gain points as you go um but of course with him, it's it's more of a lowering entropy and creating order within the universe. And each time okay. we learn something new, um, this mm -hmm. order, we're, we're creating balance, I guess. See what's, right. Know. In other words, each lifetime has its challenges because that's the way it's supposed to be. But Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. We yeah. just don't exist for the sake of existing. Right. We're, we're here to learn, really. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Which, which kind of also... Um, is that I understand kind of what he's thinking is sometimes people think, well, you know, what happens to us is happenstance. Like there's no order or the, I don't want to use the word predestination, but it's almost like maybe certain things that happen to you are supposed to happen to you because this is what you came here to handle that situation. Right. You know, what, what I found interesting, and this is probably one of the surprises that you mentioned uh, or that you asked about was that in the research, what we found is, it, it's almost like there, there's no such thing as coincidence. Everything is planned out for, you know, you know, everything has a reason. But when we talk to him, it's kind of, I got the impression that it's like an 80, 20, 70, 30, or okay. 70% of it is mapped out. But then there are random things that accidentally happen. Okay. Um, and it's right. almost like something unexpected will happen. And then the universe recalculates and moves forward from there and right and that makes sense because you always think also of free will yeah, yeah exactly uh, um, right and the universe if not if not yeah. it would be like there's you think that there's a how can i tell it would seem like we have free will but we don't if you think well everything is going to happen that certain way it's like okay so what's the use of free will if that's the my choice going to be anyway no matter what so right. And I'm sure that, the, you know, I, yeah. sometimes I take that into consideration. You know, those people that have that gut feeling, I'm not going to get on the plane because I have this feeling it's going to go down. They decide not to, you know, yeah. and then they they do that, that 30%. Uh, I'm not going to get on the plane thing, you know, and, and stuff like that. What I like about Tom, uh, too, is that he he, uh, I, he was the one that was the most mysterious going into this documentary. He, he's mm -hmm. At the time, he wasn't very well known um i think he did coast to coast radio maybe twice at this point um but his online presence wasn't as big as it probably is now but he uh he he, he talks about when he got started because he started at the monroe institute as one of the engineers that helped set up the uh the labs that they created okay. uh, which later went on to become hemi sync and um mm -hmm the facility that it is now so he 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 went out to the monroe institute um well he, he his scientific lab was his science lab was sent out was invited by bob and Roe to come out and they they talked and tom at the time was kind of skeptical and he's like you know i don't know what you know is this guy just trying to make a dollar you know selling a book you know but you know, Bob, I don't know if you're familiar with Bob and Roe, but he's, you know, he, he made millions in the cable and radio TV industry, so he didn't really need it. 
and the same thing I noticed that with, that with Tom uh, okay. is that I was like, is this is Tom? You know, one of these guys that you know they're just looking for a you know a way to make a dollar, and so they come up with this elaborate story about out of body experiences and it, but once you meet Tom, it's kind of like you realize that we went to it, we were invited to his house and we saw that, you know, he, he made his money. He, he lived mm -hmm. comfortably. He, he wasn't wealthy, but he's definitely right. Right. Just know. on what he was doing as this engineering or yeah, had he's nothing a, to do with. He worked at NASA as a yeah. physicist. So he, he, he made, you know, he was fine. I think he, he retired right after we, he retired, we met up with him. And most of the time okay. he just gives his books away for free. Right. Right. Yeah. It's not a, I know exactly where you're coming like, from. He's not making money off of this. So it's, I mean, he makes well, a little bit so that you can do some. Right, talk, right. But, and I know what, yeah. and it's almost like more the passion for the project or whatever it is he's discussing versus like you said, oh, I'm going to put this together because it's going to sell great. <laughs> like that's the real motivator, you know, and I might need to spice yeah. it up a little bit so that it's, yeah. And and unfortunately in the, that area of the afterlife and things like that, yeah, you do get some people getting in on that that are like, their motives are questionable and they're more into sensationalism than actually pursuing, you know, facts. Right. Even though that's a very right. fuzzy field sometimes to get facts on, but yeah, it, uh, let me ask you because I'm, sure. I used to do hypnotherapy. I used to have a hypnotherapy a practice for many years. What happened when you started interviewing hypnotherapists? What, what were you talking to them about? The past life regression? Uh, some of them. Yes. Uh, we, um, in the films, we don't really go into hypno, uh, past life regression that much. Okay. Um, there's one woman, Brenda, Brenda Jenks. She was one of April's teachers. Um, I don't remember. I can't remember the date. April probably the best one to talk about that. But she is a hypnotherapist. Mm -hmm. um, we did, uh, outside of the film, I did do a past life regression with her which was okay. interesting. I've never done that before. Um, yeah, we didn't, other than that, other than her, I can't remember. Um, nobody was actually a clinical hypnotherapist or okay. official mm -hmm. other than her that I can remember. Okay. Uh, Lindsay, um, who, she's from New Jersey. She had a near death experience. Okay. Um, which was kind of like a, well, it wasn't really a past life regression, but she kind of saw things that were were parallel to a past life regression through her near death experiences. Right. Kind of like the same thing, like that's interesting. Kind of like in front of a council, and they're like, okay. "Well, here's you know, you, you got to keep working, you got to go back, you know, kind of thing." Yeah, and, kind of one of those review boards. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And the reason why I asked you is because a lot of people have asked me because of the, I used to do alternative hypnosis. I do, you know, I, I did the regular stuff, like lose weight, and stop smoking, all that other stuff. But a lot of people would yeah. ask me a past life regression. Is it real? And I said, well, there's no proof, but that people that have undergone it, it affects them, whether they do visit a past life or it's all, all man head and made in their imagination. The results are that it does affect them, especially with deep-seated stuff, phobias, weird stuff that sometimes um, typical therapy doesn't work for them. So right. we get a lot of, right. I have had people ask me that. It's like, there's no way that I could tell you, you know, and I said, and the majority of people are nobodies. <laughs> there's, in other words, there's no way to ever say, you know, we could look this person up historically and verify the information given. Right. And even then right. you're treading a thin line because this, you know, the subconscious basically holds everything. You know, you could have read that information and it's stored in your subconscious mind. And you don't, in other words, you really don't know you're making it up, but you're not pulling it from the nowhere. You, it's been somewhere you ran across that information. So, yeah, that's why I asked you about that. I was curious to see what you had come across. We did a interview uh, with another project that uh, a few years ago. It's part of Shortcuts on the Path. It's a little series that we've done for Path 11 TV. Mm -hmm. and one of the, one of the people that we talked to is a uh, his name is James. He he's a hypnotherapist up in um, in the Albany, New York area. Okay. And he 
he flat out told us, he goes, I don't know if there's a past life thing, but you can tap into it and people will tell you a story. Yes. That helps them. He goes, he, he goes, I just want to be on record. I don't know for sure if that's mm-hmm. a thing. And he, right. you know, he's done, you know, I don't know how many. Yeah, you do. You do. Of- and, and I would say, you know, you have people sometimes that come in there with expectations. Like I know I lived in the, because I'm very uh, interested in that time period. You know, they have this, and then right. when you put them back, they come up with something totally that they're like, what? You know, in other words, that you can't even say, well, you know what? They're capturing something that maybe they've read a lot about because they like either that country or that time period. And they're just like, they're doing a romance novel kind of version of the of the regression. No, they come up with stuff that is totally alien to them. And I've had people that can even smell, have smells while they're doing the past life regression. You That's can say, how does that work? But yeah, they can, you know, they've been... The, the example I'm going to use is that they were they were a freak fisherman. They were by the the sea and they could smell of in the regression they could smell the sea water. So it's that vivid is my point. But yeah, it's it's a very interesting thing. But of course, there's you know when you start trying to quantify it as far as proof, and the best you're going to get you know and I know that there's a lot of you know how they've done some where they've um, where children have had past life uh, recalls. And they go back yeah. and they verify, yeah, that person that, you know, did exist. That one's a little bit more convincing. The point being that usually when you're a child, you're very limited how much information you actually read. Exactly. Where you could say, hey, this kid basically came across this information and all of a sudden they became that pilot or whatever. It was like, That's one of the ones I've heard. But it's yeah, a difficult I, thing. It's yeah. a difficult area to prove, I guess. Yeah, it, it seems like um it it's not a sure thing even though it, you can witness so many past life ex- experience sessions oh, yeah. that and you come out thinking that's got to be real but then you look it up and you see some of like the facts or the facts mm-hmm. that they laid out don't line up exactly but exactly. there's similarities and yeah oh. and the, the, no, well, the um... kid thing is really interesting the kid, because, and I'm going to give you a perfect example sometimes. And by the way, I'm talking from the point of a hypnotherapist, which you're there to help the client. You're not there to say, hey, you, you made that up. One time I had a person come in and she is reliving where she was accused of witchcraft. Okay. In the United States. And she describes being burnt at the stake. I was like, that doesn't sound right. Sure enough, in the United States. Anybody accused of being a witch got hung. He never got burned. And I was like, okay. Oh, that's interesting. This is something you read, which, yeah, in Europe, that's what they would do. But in the United States, they did not burn witches. They would hang them. They'd do a lot of other horrible things. So, you know, anybody accused of being a witch, in other words, but not burning at the stake. And I was like, hmm. See, but again, you know, you're there as a hypnotherapist. You're there to help the person, not like say, hey, no, no, no. Either you're in the wrong country or you're making this up from something that, you know, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of exposure out there to that. And I don't know if you ever heard it in the also theories that we can even reincarnate into other planets. I've heard that. Yes. You yeah. know, that's a, that's a, that's another one. That's like kind of a little bit of a, you know, in other words, it's not just a human experience. You could, your soul or your essence, whatever you want to call it, could decide I want to incarnate in a Venus or whatever, you know, or none of the, you know, galaxy. And I was like, Oh, I'm having a hard time with the human thing. <laughs> Let alone um, it. That reminds me of a, a book by another filmmaker. Of course, I, I can't. Um, his memories or his name is slipping my memory. Uh, but I believe it's called Flipside. Okay. And he, go, he he's a filmmaker and he goes out and he films uh, uh, through uh, Michael Newton. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Yes, I'm, I, yes I'm very familiar with Michael Newton. I guess he... He uh, he followed a few of Michael Newton's uh, hypnotherapists around, mm-hmm. and so he, he's recorded so many, and he put it into a book. Um, there's a movie in a book. Uh, so, and you you watch these hypnotherapy sessions, mm-hmm. but there's one in like I, I want to say it's like the middle of the book where it's the person that is reincarnated from an alien ship. Okay. 
and it's there it's like this whole alien race that's come to earth to help earth progress in a mm -hmm. certain way and everybody else goes to like the spirit world where they meet dead relatives this one person just comes from like this mothership that's hovering okay. around earth and then they go back to i don't know what whatever planet uh but so so the uh, um the author i really should look up his name um he asked the hypnotherapist at the end of it, what, what's the deal with that one? That was completely mm -hmm. different. And the hypnotherapist is like, yeah, every once in a while we get one of those that, that come from this yes. alien yeah. planet, uh, yes. alien world. Yeah. And one of the first ones that came across that, well, that wrote about it, it's a gentleman. He's already passed away with Dr. William Baldwin. Okay. okay. Cause I used to do work also in spirit attachments and, you know, a lot of these doctors, by the way, psychiatrists, doctors, whatever they were, they ran across this phenomena by coincidence. It wasn't that they were looking for that. They were hypnotizing their clients for age regression, trying to find out why do you have this phobia or why, you know, maybe this, you know, something that people didn't remember and that if they came across it, it would help them. And all okay. of them kind of go into that. All of a sudden they're going into past life. And at the beginning, a lot of them are thinking that it's just the patient, And they're like, okay, let's go with it. But later on, they come to find out. It's a, but anyway, he was one of the ones that I read about um, that his book came out in the 90s, where he discusses where he finds spirit attachments and they're not human spirits. What they are, are aliens, as in that they're attached because they have a way of attaching like to etheric body. And basically they're ob observing you know, uh, the human being. And basically it's a process, you know, you detach him, you oh, make yeah. him go away, whatever. But in other words, he was one of the first ones that I read about. And then you do read about other, um, about other doctors or mental health people that have used, used hypnosis that have run across that where it, where it is an alien when or non-human entity. How's that from another planet? Because there's other non-human stuff. That's, that's a whole, but yeah. uh, it's very interesting where they, it's almost like a science exper experiment. They're attached to the human to observe. And that, that is, you want to yeah. say they don't know about boundaries. How's that? You know, like you're not supposed to do that kind of thing. But again, how do you quantify that? It's a very interesting field. It's, yeah. yeah so... That and and uh, as a matter of fact, I don't know if you've also heard of people, uh, you know, the recovered memories of abductees, et cetera. That's a whole different thing also with the hypnosis. So let me ask you, Michael, when you started uh, doing the film and you interviewed, you know, all these different sources, did it confirm for you the belief that there is life after death of the human, uh, the death of the human body? Yeah, the, it, it definitely um confirmed that yeah there is something does happen after your body dies you do move on whether uh, and of course you know everybody i think is going to be slightly different mm -hmm. some people i think go off and they go to the spirit world and they maybe reincarnate on another planet maybe they just never come back to earth maybe they never reincarnate again and i think there's some people that just they die and they're born instantly again. It's like, right. there's no turnaround. It's, it's like, right. They boot around again. They come right. through. Yeah. Uh -huh. But then I, I, from also what I've heard is that <laughs> we're living multiple lives at the same time. Right. Happening simultaneously. So it's, it's the like, real mind bender. there's, and working on the films, there's so much evidence that for me personally, was answered but at the same time it's in a way that i can't i can't put it out there that would prove it to anybody else it's That's like this the problem with this field yeah, that is the problem with this field you can have theories yeah. you can have hypotheses you can have but as far as to replicate it where you could put out a model so people could do it that's it's really really hard is you're always, I would, I want to say, <clears throat> let me ask you, did you interview anybody as far as the near death experience? Yes. Um, yeah. I, um, Lindsay, she, um, I, I mentioned her before her, yeah. her near death experience. She got struck by lightning at a, Ooh. like a beach 
area. Okay. And yeah, she, um, it, it's a really interesting story. It's in the first film. Um, basically, yeah, she, she went through the tunnel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she was at this council. They said, you got to go back. Uh, well, no, actually she, I, I, I she, she kind of wanted to stay, but there was something and she later found out that it was her kids that were still right. Living. I always hear that you're kind of like she had to come back for given a choice. Yeah, you're right. given a choice. Um, yeah, I it, and and, and you I, know yeah. what? It always because I'm sure that that's I think that 70 30 split that Thomas was. Yeah, it's almost like because let's face it, I imagine if there's a moment that it's your time, it's like your time, you're not gonna yeah. get that that question, do you want to go back? It's like whatever, however badly you might be needed. You don't. I don't think you get that that choice. Like, do you want to go back? And um, yeah. And the reason why I asked you about that is, I say, you know, nowadays they can resuscitate people so much so than before. You know, uh, as far as you know, besides like you know, before people they would put you in an ambulance and cart you off, and you hope that by the time you got to the emergency room, now you know you have paramedics that work on you. People now know more about CPR, basic CPR, but at least they can keep your heart going, you know, there's, and I'm thinking, you know, I wonder if he came across more uh, instances of that near death experience, because I've heard people sometimes 20, 25 minutes, they can be brought back. Yeah. And that that reminds me of uh, the CPR, uh, Daniel Brinkley. I think it was his Mm -hmm. first near death experience. He uh, was struck by lightning on the phone. Wasn't did he get struck twice? Or am uh, I making that up? He may have. I know okay. the first time it was he was on the phone and he get and he got struck by lightning. Okay. But it was like they were doing CPR on him in the ambulance. Mm-hmm. And he, his consciousness was kind of like following the ambulance to the hospital. He was kind of like attached somewhat. Yeah. But loosely attached. Uh and now I if I can't remember exactly, but something where he he doesn't make it and he goes he dies and then he wakes up i think it's 20 30 minutes later outside the morgue oh, oh that shit. It's, I, I remember <laughs> daniel brinkley yeah. but i read he i what he brought this book out like in the 80s i want to say yeah, or early 90s yeah. it was like a way back that i read it and i remember that and it was like um yeah so in other words they had already taken him to the morgue is what you're saying yeah yeah and then I think his second near death experience was uh, something in sur- something happened during surgery. Right, and he had I, the I, yeah. I, sh- I should that, read those that... books again. It was so long ago. No, it's you know what it is when you have so much material. Like I said, I remember reading it. I probably read it more than once, but right now I just feel I just remember the outlines, and I remember that he got struck, yeah. that yeah. not struck twice, but that he had two near death experiences, and more to the point that that one I'm going to tell you. The thing about the near-death experience, when people describe conversations and people in other rooms, hey, that to me is more proven because there's no way that if you are either in an operating room or in an emergency room being worked on, that you know who's there having what conversation and what they're dressed and looking like. And you just, God, now there's countless uh, people saying, hey, Exactly like what you described. They hover up and they're looking down at them being worked on. And then they kind of float yeah. off and they they hear conversations. And that's the part where that to me has a lot of merit as far as being proven. Because I know, I don't know if did you ever see that one where they, um, some doctors trying to disprove it, that they kind of like opened up somebody's skull, you know, when they anesthetized just this area. And they started pushing on different parts of the brain that kind of duplicated like the near death experience. So we're trying to prove the opposite. Like, no, everything that people describe is just your brain being maybe pressured or, you know, if, as you're dying. Yeah, I, I did. I think I, that does sound familiar. And it's like they, they hit one area. Right. And like dead aunt Sylvia showed up and she's like, yeah, like it was like a uh, real weird, like uh, yeah. in that, that, that tunnel, um, that sensation of going through the tunnel, you know, like they, yeah. they were replicating it as depending on what parts of the brain they pressed. And I was like, okay, I understand. Yeah. I get it. But that still doesn't answer how people 
know about things that they have no either see or hear. As you know, they say, even if you might look unconscious, you still have sometimes you're hearing. And so, yeah, that's why I was saying that that's a very interesting thing about the near death. Yeah, there's, I know there, there is a, a group. I don't know if they're doctors or mm -hmm. uh, investigators, but what they've done with these medical uh, situations like in, in emergency rooms and trauma uh, areas of the hospital, I've heard that they've put images up high that you can only see if you're hovering oh, really? um, from the top of the, you know, the ceiling, I guess you would say. So you can mm -hmm. see like a picture of, I don't know, I don't know what the pictures are, but like a giraffe or uh, something mm -hmm. that you wouldn't expect in the hospital on top of like, I guess a shelf or whatever. Would be right. Like okay. And they're like, so when people come back and they say, oh, the doctor had the nurse do this and they would only know that from being in the room, what was on top of that cabinet over there, you know, or what, you know, what did you, what else did you see when you were up there? And I, I can't remember if they. I had not heard of that, but that is so yeah. interesting. That is excellent. That is great. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I have to look again. You know, who, which hospitals do that? And, right, yeah. something that is like, like you said, a picture of a giraffe. Who's going to expect that? Right. In a in some type of hospital setting. And I that's think that's very there, interesting. I think there was. The more I think about, it, there was a couple cases that actually they nailed it. It's like they said everything in the room. They described it and they. They pointed out the pictures. I, I wish I could remember. Right. Yeah. That's well, because basically what we're looking for is the survival of your consciousness, which is what everybody wants. Um, once your human body dies, what happens to your consciousness? Uh, let's face it. None of us want to think that that's it. Right. It's over. We're right. so, uh, well, and um, let me, uh, what else did you come across when you were doing the, the documentary that that you were not aware of or that changed your mind about preconceived ideas the, the other uh, uh the other thing that kind of threw me off was that you know these some of us you know that do have that are able to remember past lives there, there's some of us that they come to find out that we've had like thousands of past lives already and a lot of us are kind of I don't know who exactly uh, I'm not saying for, for myself, but I know there's so many of us that have had uh, past lives that this is like their last life, like on okay. earth. Um, this isn't really in the film, but there's something that came up in conversation um, around the film when we we're producing the film. Um, one of the reasons why I, believe we left that out was because we you can't prove it it's right and most of the stuff it, it's that's the thing it's you can't prove it but it, it is we wanted to document everybody else's stories like right no like, i know what you're saying yeah, you're, you're, you're 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 showing it as, as a as a story not where right. hey if you're looking for me to produce a some type of evidence per se let me ask and, you when it, you say we how have you been have you experienced press lives I did somewhat, I, I mentioned Brenda before she gave us a mm -hmm. past life. Uh, I, when I had a past life regression with her, it, it was weird. Um, just in a way that because the way my brain works, I okay. have a hard time shutting it off. Oh, you're so an analytical. Go, Is that what? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm a thinker. Yes. <laughs> so that's oh, kind of yeah, analytical. analytical. Yeah. That's the best way to put it. And what, we did, I think it was like a two hour past life regression. And the whole first hour is just trying to get my mind to relax enough where I was yes. open to the suggestion. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's suggestion. I don't know. That's no, that's just, just a disability. I know exactly okay. what. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, you know, my eyes are closed. I'm doing this whole thing. I'm very relaxed. And then her, uh, her thing was, now look down at your shoes. What kind of shoes are you wearing? Uh-huh. With your mind's eye kind of thing. And you're trying um, to look and you're like, my, my eyes are closed. So how can I that's see? Like, yeah. That's <laughs> like, I just see black. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. I know. I know. Because I, I had clients just like you. <laughs> when you tell them, see, they're like, 
I can't see anything because my eyes are closed. So yeah, you you guys are like a whole. But anyway, yeah. keep going. That's I, you, I love to hear these stories. But it, it, I got this whole, and then this whole story opened up where okay. the blackness turned into, and I you know I don't know if I was imagining this or if I was actually okay. recalling an actual historical thing. Mm -hmm. But I woke up and I was like in this prison. I want to say it was like the 1930s. And I was a journalist that wrote a story that slandered a judge oh. that kind of, yeah, it was like I wrote a news story that slandered this judge and law enforcement, like kind of exposing them as corrupt cops and mm -hmm. a corrupt, corrupt judicial system. So they got, they framed me for something. And I remember going in front of the judge uh, and the judge, because I called him out, he put me in prison. But at the same time, I saw from the judge's point of view, I, I think I was actually both lives in this okay. conflict. So I was the journalist going to prison and the judge that did the okay. sentencing. So then I lived out the rest of the judge's life. And he was this old um very miserable guy that knew he was doing the wrong thing by sending this right like somebody in jail for so the rest of my life I, I spent alone it's like my i had kids and a family that ha really didn't want anything to do with me because i knew that i was a corrupt judge okay. it was like this whole interconnected web um of this corruption and so she would she took you to your point of death as the judge yeah and All it right. was like my last days i was in um new england watching you know it was like a rainy day watching planes take off at some cape cod airport and it was like later that day i died and i think one of my kids was with me it was just really really depressing like they were all kind of happy i was going all right <laughs> it was it was like, like, oh, i was like a burden on them basically. finally he's gone <laughs> yeah and, yeah <laughs> But there's things in that life that actually parallel this life that I'm in now. Really? Because at the time, there was like this whole fear of uncovering truth mm -hmm. and speaking my mind, even though like I know part of my family would have a problem with this. Okay. And, and there were so many things with the judge's life. It's like I go to Cape Cod every year. And I remember certain things that, of course, I, I started going to Cape Cod after I had this past life regression. I was like, oh my God, yeah, I know that airport. I used to stand there and watch planes take off in the rain. This is kind of the area where I died. Isn't and then that interesting? I, I did get a name of the reporter that was put in prison. And I looked it up. I, of course, I can't. I should have written all this down. <laughs> but oh. I looked it up. I know. It was. I should have recorded it too, but you I, know I, what? my clients, I used to do, I used to record them and then I would send them the MP3 file because I say, because a lot of them would be like, huh? and then later on they'd call and they Hey, you know, I, I get it. <laughs> so anyway, let me ask you something. Once yes. the, in other words, you never followed the life of the reporter after you went to jail, everything, just the rest of your regression was the judge. Yeah. Cause the reporter died in jail. That was the oh, impression I got from the past. Like, okay. Regression. Okay. 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 The um, and when I did, it was like that night I got home, I, I went on the internet and I looked up the name that I was given of the reporter. Okay. Um, and it turns out I didn't get the name of any newspaper that this reporter was linked to, but there was a school, I want to say it's in Missouri or Kansas, where there's a whole department of journalism and it's, it's the same name. But oh. I couldn't get a first name that linked up. So it's like, it's right. close, but it's not linking perfectly. Okay. And okay. I couldn't find that name linked to being with this judge, that, okay. this corrupt judge guy. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like part of it's there, but it's not 100%. So it's real to me, but I can't tell you that it's let me tell you something it's so funny because we're so used to exact information and in modern technology that we don't realize that back in those years misspellings were very common or different versions of a spelling of a, of a name even last names even first names um where sometimes it's like 
when you finally find it, it's like, that's what the real, because I do a lot of research myself. So, and again, you know, com, you know, you know how we're used to now, every, everything is known about everybody. Back then, you, most people lived their lives obscurely just because that's the way it was. Unless you did something yeah. good or bad that the newspapers were interested in you. No, you know, nobody yeah. was taking pictures of you or the, the closest you got was, um, you know, like they would do the socials, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so or spending the summer at the whatever at their cottage on the beach. And even then, mostly they would never even say the woman's first name. It was Mr. and Mrs. John Smith. You never knew what her name. So exactly. there's a lot of, uh, as far as research to prove it one way or the other, but that's very interesting that you found that name connected yeah, to I, that journalism school. That's interesting. I should have, I should have, in hindsight, I should have recorded everything. Maybe, maybe I'll get it done again. But you but. said, you said something that it did, in other words, because, and I don't know how she did it, but sometimes, especially when somebody's new, you want to ease them into a past life regression. You don't want to see something that's too horrific, but mostly you ask what's the most appropriate thing for this person to see. And you said that there was something when you saw this lifetime that resonated with you present time. Yeah. The, the, the way the, the, the whole fear about these films coming out. Ah, and how, okay. How the, okay. Uh, how my family would, view it i know most of my family you know that they, they're actually interested in it and supportive you were it was like the last was, time i did this i got punished yeah it's, it's basically you know speaking truth and being punished for it yeah yes um that that was that's basically the moral of the story yeah i mean people don't realize that things like that did happen the um you know? and th this weird not completely in sync memory is kind of re reminds me of the Mandela effect. That's okay. a lot of people. I don't know if you're. Yes, you of course. About. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, there, there's times where I'm, I hear, you know, people list off a bunch of Mandela effect scenarios okay. and I'm like, yeah, right. that's, you know, the Berenstein Bears was, you know, it's spelled the other way. And they're like, no, it's been this way for the last 40 years. And, um, I know. You know, they're, they're, you know, you probably know more than I do, but uh, well, no, but it, I've heard of people that, in other words, they they're not looking for Mandela effect. They almost trip over it because they have a certain memory of whatever. Let's say a product, anything like what you yeah. just described, and they're like, I saw, I remember this in childhood, or what, I, precisely, it's a, I know this thing is this way, and then it's changed. Yeah. And yeah, it's almost yeah. like the same thing with this, with the trying to link past lives to mm -hmm. actual tangible evidence. And it's like slightly That off. makes you think who's tweaking it. Are we looking at a butterfly effect? Uh, because, you know, that thing is like it's one little change will kind of like, you know, move things around a little, just a little bit, you know, where. Right. Or is it coincidental that happenstance or is somebody going back there and tweaking history or tweaking which sometimes it doesn't make sense because sometimes the things are minimal. Yeah. The differences are minimal, but it's a very interesting idea as far as physics are concerned. And God, and because here we're talking about, what is it? Parallel universes, time, tra time travel. Uh, God, that's a whole yeah. different thing. Um, because, yeah. you know, some people with that parallel universe, it's almost like, Basically, they're you know when people see ghosts, it's not really a ghost. It's basically you, you're seeing an intrusion from another uh, dimension or another universe that's existing, coexisting with ours at the same time. They say all time is happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. So is mm -hmm. this an interference of some other? Right. Know, is this ghost? You know, is this an actual entity living in the 1800s that we're our time, right. our fabric of time is overlapping with their fabric exactly. of time. Exactly. Right. They're not, they're not yeah. ghosts. They're not dead people coming out. They're yeah. as far as the, the, you know, they're, they're have, they're living their existence in that moment, whatever, whenever it was. Yeah. That's a real mind bender, isn't it? <laughs> it is. <laughs> the, let me ask you now, after you did that, did you have any paranormal experiences during or after you finished that? 
that documentary? Yeah. Um, y yes. Um, <laughs> it uh, actually, when we were in the middle, the first film came out in 2009. The last film of the trilogy came out in 2016. Okay. So within that time, I think we were in the making of the second one. I was living in this house. Um, I'm in Kingston, New York, a pretty historic area, about two hours north of New York City. And the house I was in, I had an office upstairs where um, I was working on the film. And I experienced, um, I guess you, the best way you put it, it was a haunted house. In simple okay. Terms. There were things happening in this house that, um, that we cannot explain. Um, like my wife heard stuff, my daughter, especially, she was probably about five or six at the time. Okay. We've never raised her thinking that, you know, ghosts was a real thing. Right, was, right. Like priming her for it. Yeah. We, we kind of kept her neutral. Like we didn't really force her on religion, um, or, you know, spirits or anything, right. even aliens at this point. And, in this house in particular, she, we, we lived in two other houses before this, and she would always ask us, so in this one house, um, she started asking us, oh, where's, are there ghosts here, you know? And, and you're like, oh. No, not that I've seen. <laughs> right. Like, I'm trying not to lie, here. but yeah, we've, we've heard things. Um, uh, yeah, no, the, the house, something strange with that house. Um, April and I were working on the film and we were on the second floor and I had basement steps going, uh, these like wood deck steps that went down into like an open basement and they were kind of loose. So when you walk down them, it's like the kind of like the whole area of the house kind of shook. And mm -hmm. so we're, we're working on the film and, you know, we're trying to get this sound bite just right. And all of a sudden we hear somebody like roll down the steps and a woman scream. Oh, and I'm thinking, oh no, you know, did my wife just my daughter, right. my wife and daughter at, weren't home at the time. Um, my dog was home, and me and April were home. And I'm thinking, did my wife just come home and fall down the steps, or my daughter? So I run down there, and no, there's no, you know, right, nobody else is here. So, um, <laughs> I, I'm yelling up to April, and I was like, that was this house, right? And she's like, oh yeah, that that was somewhere downstairs oh. so, so i'm i w start walking down the basement at this point and uh she goes that's it that's the noise and it, it was the basement steps okay and uh so later um i don't know maybe it was like a week maybe two weeks later um my grandmother happened to know the person that used to live in that house oh. and it, the woman who lived there um was fairly elderly at the time I, I want to say it was probably at the 1980s when she lived there mm -hmm. and she fell down the steps and laid at the bottom of the steps for probably, uh, I want to say it was like four, maybe five hours before somebody found her. Okay. She lived through that, but I guess it was very traumatic and she was, sure. I don't know if she was right after that. Um, and she, I think she died shortly after that. Um, but yeah, you could for all of, for for all things that 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 fall caused her death. Yeah, and um, there <laughs> there's other wow. things that happen. Like um, we're the living room in that house. My wife and I. It was probably like nine o'clock at night. My daughter went to bed upstairs, and we were in the TV room, which is like this long, probably about twenty foot hallway through the dining room, wood floor. So you could hear somebody walking on that as they approached the TV room. So my wife and I were watching TV and we hear footsteps. I'm like, oh, this is my daughter coming. And uh, so, you know, I pause the TV and we wait for my daughter to show up and she never comes around the corner into the room. I was like, oh, she probably, you know, then I'm thinking she, she had to pass the kitchen. She, she's probably getting cookies or something she's not supposed to be eating. So <laughs> you run. And nobody's downstairs. And I go up and I run upstairs and my daughter's sound asleep in her bed. So this happens like every night now. And I'm thinking, oh, you know what it is? I turn on, I started turning on the heat probably about a month ago. 
and as the the baseboard heats up the floor, the floors readjust and they start cracking like somebody's walking on it. So this happens for a good for the main you know a good part of the winter. Okay. Springtime, I turn off the heat. It still happens. Oh, so much for that theory. <laughs> and it's like you could hear like footsteps, like, and then I started to analyze it, and it's like an old. It's not like a kid because my daughter, you know, when they're, they're like five, six years old, they A to B. It's a constant run or a sprint. Mm-hmm. Where this, these footsteps, it's like a lumbering step, you know. Right. I was about to ask you, what did it sound the footfall? Was it something yeah, heavier? It's, yeah. It's somebody, you know probably over 60 uh, in mm-hmm. my guess that you know they're not a young person right um, so it, it it was interesting yeah <laughs> see that i think those stories are so great because this is not you doing a ghost hunt this is just you living yeah you know and, and we and you have out. these experiences we were only there a year and th- that's this is the weird part too we moved in in august um it was actually it was kind of a sad story with the previous owner. It was this elderly man who um, his daughter lived in Florida and there was another relative in the area. That's not a big deal, but daughter lived in Florida, came up and he, he was so feeble at this point. He couldn't, he could barely take care of himself. So she took him to Florida to visit. And while she took him, she, she went to a realtor and put the house on the market or to, okay. to rent it out. They wanted to rent it out because he didn't want to sell it. So I guess he, he found out that he wasn't going back to this house um, probably shortly after we moved in. And from what I've heard is that about two months later, he passed away when we were okay. living in the house. And that's around the time that- That you started hearing the footsteps. We, we started hearing things. Wow. And there would be times upstairs where I would be working and I would hear, I, at the time, I, I thought it was my dog walking around. We, the dog was probably about 10 years old mm-hmm. at the time. And he, we, we could see the life being sucked out of my dog. Really? And it's like, he would be limping everywhere. He would, wouldn't want to go upstairs. Luckily, the main living area was on the first floor. And so... I hear my dog walking around. I was like, oh, that's weird. What, what's he, you know, he, he's got to go outside already for, you know. Right. So I go downstairs, and my dog's at the other end of the house sleeping in the TV room. And I was like, well, who just walked into the living room? <laughs> exactly. So, so all these things started happening. That same time, the winter, we turned the heat on. I think it's the floorboards shifting. It turns out it's somebody else walking around that we couldn't see. And then we moved out, I want to say in July that year. And then somebody actually bought the house from. Right, right. Because now he had passed away. So they put it up for sale. So somebody bought the house and we, we have a friend that knew the people who moved in. I've never met them. And they eventually talked to the family that moved Mm -hmm. in and said, Oh, what do you think of the house? Like trying to be, you know, slick about it without giving it away. And the family's like, yeah, we think it's haunted. We keep, <laughs> you don't say. We keep, we keep hearing, th- you know, somebody walking around the downstairs and weird things happen upstairs. And yeah, like our, stuff like that. It's like, yeah. and it's and from what you're telling me, everything was auditory. You never saw anything. It was just the the yeah. the noises that you hear. We, um, that's so interesting. Yeah. That's great. That, that is an excellent story because, like I said, this is what happens to people when they're living life, and it's like. What? And yet, of course, when you said you think of all the plausible reasons, the dog, and the, the other story, my my daughter and my wife just rolled down the stairs in the basement. Oh, my God. That's yeah, it's, stuff like that. That's incredible. And it's those things that you you can talk about it all day, but unless you experience it, mm-hmm. you, you can't. Yes. You can't say if, if it's true or not. That's, exactly. that's the problem. Exactly. That's exactly. It's like <laughs> not everybody walks around with cat well, well, with a phone nowadays, but you know, all these contraptions and stuff that they have on the paranormal shows is most people when you're living life and stuff happens to you. And by the way, like you said, I don't, okay, I don't have proof, but I know what I experienced and that's all I need to convince yeah. me as far as whatever, you know, whether you want to say, well, it was an imprint 
was this, but that thing that you said that the timing on it with the footsteps is after this gentleman passed away. That's very interesting because that's more than just, you could say, well, this is an imprint on the fabric of that place, something that was very repetitive. And basically it's just like a, a loop. No, no, that's, and then those, <laughs> and the new owners, we think it's haunted. No. And be <laughs> the other thing too. And I don't know how much I, I, trust this evidence but i did get a um on the i don't know the, I, the smartphone app it's called mm -hmm. an ovulus i don't know if you're yes. familiar with okay yes. so i i i was like i heard about it somewhere i was like oh, let's, this should be fun mm -hmm. so i put it on of course you know it, it says a different word like i don't know however often every 30 seconds it says something else and i put it on i, I think i had it on for five minutes it, it said some a couple words but then it said the name um i uh it said the name of the person who used to live in the house twice in a row okay i, I don't want to say the name because no i, I know what you mean but yeah. i know exactly that you're thinking okay you know some people would say well you know those apps they've just given them a bunch of words yeah. and names and everything that just stuck and they'll randomly just spit stuff out but it would it makes you wonder if I had to lay out the odds of that name twice being said. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Then you go into, yeah. you know, manipulation of electronics by the deceased. That's uh, a whole different thing. That's so interesting. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. after that, no more, no more encounters with the undead. Then I uh, actually started having, and this is towards uh, the end of the production of the second film, which was mainly about astral projection, out-of-body experiences. I began having um, out-of-body experiences at night. Um, and then, I, really? yeah, this happened on and off Interesting. ever since. And for a while there, up until, I want to say probably right before the pandemic, it was happening like a couple times a week. Where you feel the vibration. So this is without you trying else. to do it, is what you're saying. Yeah. Um, wow. So that that happens actually quite a bit. The problem is I don't I don't have these elaborate stories that like William Buhlman and mm -hmm. so many other astral right 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 have. <laughs> but it's. Do you know um, what was there a triggering event or something that you say after this happened is when I started experiencing these out of body things. Yeah, there's in the second film, um, the path beyond the physical. There's a there's a whole sequence, um, probably about two thirds of the way in. Where we demonstrate how hemisync works, and this is the main tool of the Monroe Institute, where one frequency goes in one ear, and then a slightly different frequency of sound goes okay. in the other ear, and it entrains the brain that different frequency. I want to say it's like 104 hertz, and then 100 hertz. So your brain is entrained to this four hertz in the middle. And it kind of okay. syncs up your brain, hence the term hemisync. Mm -hmm. So there's, we basically, for this film, I made <laughs> my own version of hemisync. And that's that's true hemisync in the film. I, I think we were actually using 100 and 104 hertz. So okay. of course, I'm hearing, and it, it, and if you listen to it in stereo, the one, you know, your, your speaker is going to be slightly off. So I'm listening to this in headphones, probably, I don't know, several hours over the course of a couple of days, just doing these okay. tones. And that, I think, triggered it for me to have it. Oh. Have it. Um, hmm. That is so interesting. And the last time, and most of the time, like early on, it was kind of more elaborate, these scenes that would happen. It's like I would wake up and there would be like a figure walking in the bedroom, just around the bed. Um, you, you I would hear things like I'd be my mind would be awake, but my body's asleep. And I would mm -hmm. have like, I don't, I don't know if you've ever sensed this, but when you're on the verge of astral projection, it's like you have this super hearing. And I, I thought like the one morning, I, I think it was an early morning, my wife and daughter are in the other room and I'm sound asleep, sleeping in. And I hear footsteps like you can hear the carpet crunch. Okay. And I feel, it sounds like somebody's approaching the bed. And I'm in this state probably for a good maybe minute, maybe two minutes. 
And so I'm thinking my daughter's about to wake me up and I turn around, there's nobody there. Um, All right. And, you know, just stuff like that. A lot of, um, I think I, I, I woke up at one point and I'm like floating in the middle of the living room. It's okay. like most of my stuff, i never leave the house. It's like I'm in this out-of-body state within the house. Okay. Okay. I've flown through walls, you know, that, that within the house. Um, it's almost I like you're, 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 you're doing it, testing, see how, what this feels like. And yeah, and the that last time. That is so time, interesting <laughs> because that time, thing about you seeing, hearing somebody <laughs> approaching you on the bed yeah. and you're thinking, you're not wigging out because you're thinking it's your kid that's about to wake you up. And I haven't had it in a while. Um, I want to say pre-pandemic, probably right before the pandemic hit or as it was approaching, mm -hmm. I had I had the sensation of having the out-of-body experience, but this time it's like a hand. I could feel like a hand on my head. It's like holding me in, in my in my body and it wouldn't let me leave my body at that point. And I, I think I've maybe had one slightly out-of-body experience after that. Mm -hmm. But up until then, it was like maybe two or three times a week. Wow. And it's like something kept me, it's like, no, you have to stay here to experience something to, for whatever right. reason. So I don't know. <laughs> and it happened so many times that I was losing sleep over it. It's like your sleep, and uh -huh. a lot of times I just push it away. It's like, no, I'm too tired. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta catch up on right. sleep. <laughs> and, right, uh, exactly. That is Scott. That's interesting. Let me ask yeah. you I'm, I'm, something I'm curious yeah. about. Why did you name your company Eleven? The what you named it? Yeah. So. We um, we were on a path. Um, I was thinking, you know, what, what are we going to call it? It's like, I think April in one of her meetings was like, well, you're, you're kind of like on a path, you know, mm -hmm. it's like the spiritual awakening, you know, it's this path to understanding life about after death, the path of life. Right. And, stuff. and then like, okay, path. And then, we, we named the movie first and we were like, well, we should name the company after the movie. Okay. Um, and at that point it was just the path. This is before we named out like the different trilogy. And so after we came up with the path and we're like, okay, well, it can't be the path. And then, Mm -hmm. I don't know. It, it, it was, it, I, there was so many failed names in between that. Um, <laughs> we're thinking different things. And we had numerology done. Um, okay. And it's, I guess my master number is 11. And my minor number is a two. Okay. And April's is a nine. So. Yeah. Nine and two I'm is 11. 11. By my, yeah, and so, yeah, yeah, right, exactly. And then, do so you know the reason 11th? why I ask you is that I'm partial to the number ten. I was born on the eleventh. My husband was born on the eleventh. The eleventh okay. is so, so, uh, yeah, everything. So that's why I was. I wonder if he's an eleventh person. Yeah, because that that's an unusual name for a company. So yeah, it and I and I understand the numerology aspect of it. Yeah, turns out April was born at one eleven p.m. Uh -huh. and we lived eleven miles apart at the time. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little stuff here and there um, yeah. that added up to eleven. She 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 it. knows. She, I'm sure she could come up with like a, a bunch more things that happened that linked us to eleven. Interesting. Like, what, what about Path right. Eleven? I needed to be a story behind <laughs> that. Was like that that name. There's a reason for that eleven in there. Anyway, Michael, thank you so much for spending this time. It has been absolutely wonderful for my podcast listeners because I am going to have a link to your website on the credits. What is your website address? You can find uh, the podcast, um, which April hosts. She does a great job hosting. It's path11podcast.com. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find our TV site at path11tv.com. Um, people can sign up for a seven-day free trial. Um, we have uh, everything after the films is on that site. We've, we have an interview show. Um, we were invited to... Um, film the afterlife conference for the last uh, i want to say four years now 
Okay. Um, so we have a lot of presentations, talks on path11tv.com. And slowly but surely, we'll be moving our films over to there and future film projects will be moved over to Path 11 TV. Do you have any projects in mind now or that you're working on? Yep. Um, we are going into pre-production uh, now for a future film. Um, there's no <laughs> date or okay. schedule yet. Um, we're just kind of loosely outlining it. Um, it's about after death communication, okay. um, which can be right now it, we have a wide range of things. It's EVPs, mediums, channeling, mm -hmm. even hauntings might even be in there if we can find it appropriate. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. The delivery It's just the, how it ends up, you know, the, the message comes through again. Yeah. Thank you so much. It has been wonderful to speak to you. Uh, thank you. And I wish you the best of luck on, uh, on all your new projects. Thank you. Yeah. Take and fun. uh let me know maybe next time if you know I, when because I'm, I'm working on my new season of my show uh maybe we could do something where we could bring april in if she's interested so because you you know she you, you're telling me she she works a lot like in the um alternative healing or what is it uh hyp hypnotherapy yeah. reiki things like that yeah um uh, and sh she would have been here today but she's she's got a day full of clients um she does mental health counseling and um, she also does Reiki healing. Mm -hmm. um, and she she could talk for hours about her experiences. <laughs> she's good at it too. <laughs> okay, I'll make sure that we can get her. We'll coordinate for the dates to make sure that sure. we can have her on. Again, thank you yeah. so much and good luck. Thank you. This is great. Take care. Bye-bye. Wow, this was so interesting. I love it. Well, you know what? It's refreshing to speak to somebody like I always do. You know, you have the people that are tried and true enthusiasts and the paranormal. Yes, it is. It's real. It exists. And then you get the person that, like him, he wanted to, you know, grew up in, I guess, for lack of a better word, a normal household with normal, what can I say, um, expectations of what the afterlife is. Heaven, hell, you're good. If you're bad, is going to catch up to you after you die and that's it and um and i know that a lot of people don't like to think about it because it's almost like let's face it if you're alive and you're happy to be alive you don't want to think about death and i think we do that on purpose that's the way we're supposed to be but <clears throat> sometimes when you have experiences like what he described where you maybe have um uh, the death of loved ones, whether they're family or friends in a short period of time, sometimes those questions, in other words, it's almost like what I learned as I was growing up about what happens to you after you die. Is that right? Is it accurate? Or is there more to it? Sometimes that has to do with, let's say, if you're worried about the person that passed on, or if it was something unexpected, that you think it, ah, I wish there was a way I knew to make sure that this person is okay. You know, in other words, I could make my peace with them having passed on if I knew they were okay. And by this, how can I say it? By this, I'm not talking like what he described. When you have maybe an elderly person that's passed away, or sometimes even a younger person, but they've had, they have some type of illness, which in other words, you know that they're going to be dying. And they've even made their peace with they're going to be dying. I'm talking about other types of um, situations where it's unexpected. Uh, or even sometimes people become sick and they die very quickly. You know, I'm not talking about somebody where they're like ill and like they become sick and they just, they, they go downhill real, real quick. In other words, that you think, okay, there's no time for acceptance or that a lot of people then ask themselves, man, when, what I was brought up to believe, is that really the way it is? You know, I wish I knew that really what happens to us after we, do we go to heaven? Is that person okay? The pearly gates that, you know, traditional Judeo-Christian, you know, or not you're going to hell or whatever, you know, or will, or like, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people say, well, you know what? I'm going to be able to see this person again. 
It might be many years, but I will be able to see this person again when I die. So I think that those are the questions that sometimes people, that spur people on in some cases, like what he described where he took his uh, experience in filmmaking and they start to produce almost like, okay, let's, 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 let's try to gather answers to those questions. And there could be more than one answer because like we said, that's the answers to that could be so fluid, so different. And as far as producing proof, you could in some, in certain instances, maybe, but like everything else, um, you know, you're thinking, well, um, what if, you know, how can I say? It's so subjective. Everybody's different. It depends on your belief systems. It depends what, um, what's the source? What's the motivation for saying what I, I you know, um, you know, you have people that you could say, you know what, when I heard this person say this story about, let's say, an encounter or something they saw, that, you know, you say, this person is a reliable witness. This person would not make this up. I really believe that coming from that person, I really believe it. I might not have witnessed it, but I believe it because that person would never uh, say they had that experience if that wasn't the truth. As a matter of fact, they're the kind they're the kinds that are resistant. Just like when he was describing that he's here renting this house and all these things start to happen, and he's not there doing a ghost hunt. He's not trying to capture EVPs. He's not running around. He's just and then these things happen. And like I said, once upon a time, that's what people used to do when they used to have to have weird experiences. They would try to find a plausible logical explanation for why that's happening. Instead of like, oh, it's the ghost. No, it's not the ghost. He's thinking, dog heater. My wife somehow had uh, an accident down the stairs. Uh, in the case of the footsteps, it's my daughter. Um, which, by the way, I hear a lot. When people at the beginning that they start having these experiences, auditory especially, or sometimes when they catch people out of the corner of their eye, like the peripheral vision, they assume it's another family member, anything, anything but... So they don't really wake out. It's when it starts happening over and over and over again. And like he said, you get up and you look for that person. There's nobody there. Hey, th I stopped using the heater and I'm still hearing the footsteps or whatever. Okay, what are you left with? Mm. And then you ask yourself, so what do you do about something like that? Is it a real haunting? Is it an intelligent haunting? Is it something just residual, something that happened a lot? Does it get any worse? than just shuffling on the carpet. Oh, I guess if it's a rental, you don't have to worry about it. But obviously something was going on because when those new owners took over, they had already experienced something. Well, well anyway, guys, thank you for being part of my audience. I have a lot of great shows lined up. Please come back every week. I have a lot of great guests. Um, I'm considering starting to go live with some of the guests, like I said before, I had never done it because it was really difficult sometimes to bring in the guests I wanted to and make our our um, our schedules work. But let's see what we could angle where I might I do a transition where we bring in, we do the live show and let's see how that works out. And that way, my interest in it, of course, is to help bring in you you know my audience if you want to ask questions or anything while the show's going on so that we could answer again don't forget go to miamigoschronicles.com if you want links to all the podcasts whether it's sourced from me without commercial interruptions or you can go to any of the regular podcast platforms you're going to find it there marlenepardo.com again sign up for my newsletter like i said i keep you a sh once a week short article links to related videos, and I announce everything there, whether it's writing projects, if I have giveaways, you name it. Go to marlenepardo.com or miamighostchronicles.com. Again, thank you so much. You are all wonderful. <laughs>